I haven't spoken to this man in, in, in way too long. Um, and uh, I go back in the day with him. So there's so much to discuss with a man who uh, is the voice of Sunday Night Baseball on ESPN and called the Home Run Derby and will be part of the ESPN coverage in advance of tonight's Major League Baseball All-Star Game here in Los Angeles, California. My friend Carl Ravich on the Mercedes-Benz Vans phone line. How you doing, Ravi? How you been? I'm good, Richard. How are you doing? Good to speak, uh, speak with you again. It, it has been a little bit. It has. About it. it has been a minute, as they as they say. Uh, <laughs> what was that like in person last night? Seeing that, calling it last yeah, night. So it was different. Um, I would say, having done this for a long time now, and having been through the, you know, the Bryce Harpers and the Todd Frazier's, mm-hmm. um, it, it was a little different in the fact that Julio Rodriguez dominated the event. He was the only guy that got on those rolls where you kind of see seven, eight, nine in a row. Nobody else did that. Pujols was a great story, but he was a great story because he's a legend. Uh, it wasn't as if he went out there and, and lit the world on fire. Schwarber and Alonzo didn't have good nights. The energy was was unique. It's it's you know, and you can speak to this better than anybody, but there was there was a different energy than what we have seen in other ballparks. Um, so I thought it was, you know, look, it's, it's always a, a great event. Rodriguez shined last night. Soto's got all these distractions around him, and he was able to focus. But I would say, relatively speaking, it, it was probably a little flatter than other derbies we've seen, and through no fault of anybody's, but that's you're, you're, you're kind of beholden to the, to the participants. And last night, after Rodriguez and Seeger you know, hit, what, 55 homers between them in the first round. You're like, right. this is going to be the most amazing home run derby we've ever seen. And it, literally, you were at the top of the roller coaster after those two guys hit, and it kind of steadily went down after that. That's That was my impression being there. Before we uh, get to the, uh, serve the youth uh, of the evening and, and then obviously Juan Soto's future, immediate and long term, uh, let's talk about the OG in uh, in pool holes. What a, what a moment – Last night, yeah. I, I was saying that, you know, obviously there's only one Ted Williams, uh, but when uh, Ted Williams threw out that ceremonial first pitch prior to the 99 All-Star game in Fenway Park and the all-time team along with the current All-Stars right. all converged on him, that's that's what it kind of felt like to see, uh, you know, everyone surrounding Pujols last night after his first A.B. Uh, uh, that that was amazing. What a moment that was, Carl, last night. That was night. cool. And, and we were sitting right there, obviously. We're right off the third baseline right. on the field. Uh, And it started with the Dominican players. I mean, they were the ones that kind of started a trickle effect. And if I'm not mistaken, we we went to commercial. We came back and everybody had gotten up and and gone to them uh, on both sides. Yeah, I I certainly went back to Fenway Park in 99 and Ted Williams in the golf cart and Tony Gwynn and discussing with the All-Stars, do you you smell, you know, the smoke coming (laughs) off your bat when you foul the ball off, et cetera, et cetera. It absolutely had that feel. And the other side of it was, to his credit, you know, Pujols was willing to embrace it. He, he wasn't, he wasn't sort of brushing it off like everybody goes sit down. He 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 enjoyed the moment, and we, we we've been at ESPN throughout his career. You were certainly there for a great part of it. Uh, the machine, you know, has been reduced a little bit in his in his age, but he's one of the greatest right-handed hitters that we've ever seen and will ever see. Um, and to see the, the reverence that people like Manny Machado, et cetera, who've been pretty vocal about the lack of attention that he thinks Pujols is getting in his final year, and Miguel Cabrera, that, that was one of those moments. And, and that was one of the moments that when you watched the home run derby last night that you'll remember was how everybody you know, treated Albert Pujols. And I assume tonight uh, they may both get similar treatment, mm. but it was really unique, and it, and it was unscripted. There, there was no choreography behind it. They realized uh, we should go and, and surround this guy and, and salute him. And you saw Soto was the one bowing down to him uh, more than anyone else. <laughs> Carl Ravich, Sunday night baseball voice and longtime voice of baseball and also sports center uh, right here on the Rich Eisen show on the night of the all-star game. Uh, Juan Soto getting a million dollars for winning. Um, and uh, that's chump change. It's interesting that Rodriguez made more money last night than he's going to make in his minimum year contract this year. But what is the deal with Soto? Why why, why are he and uh, Washington seemingly on the verge of parting ways here? Carl? Well, I, I think it's multifaceted. I think that there's – I think it was a sincere offer. Um I think that the sale of the Nationals is a big deal. I think any prospective owner coming in 
would like to make sure that that stuff is taken care of. Um, look, you can look at it from both sides. He's, he's obviously one of the great young players in the game. He's uniquely talented with his ability to, to recognize strikes and balls. He can elevate the baseball. But baseball, and we know this from years, is not an individual sport. Uh, at some point, you, you can't allow your franchise to have such a percentage of the salary be spent on one guy. And, look, he does, he, given where we are economically, he's going to get four or $500 million over whatever length of time this contract goes. But Mike Trout hasn't been in the playoffs, let alone mm-hmm. threatened a World Series, and he is the unquestioned best baseball player on the planet. If Soto's a notch down from him, well, how much money do we commit to one player and who are we going to be able to surround him with? And if we're going to get, you know, what what the Marlins uh, got when they let Miguel Cabrera go years ago and a couple of really good pitchers and major league ready players, well, do are, are we better off? And, and those are legitimate questions. Um, it was odd. I mean, I don't know what you saw yesterday, but – Soto sitting there answering questions and literally kind of lurking over his his left shoulder is Scott Boris, <laughs> <laughs> kind of filtering the questions, hearing what people are asking, making sure that Soto is is not going to misspeak. Um, that that was that was an interesting look yesterday. So I you know I, I look I see both sides of it. Um, he's still got a year and two, two years left, you know. So I, it's unique uh, and it's unique to baseball that. One guy who's two years out of free agency is is turning down $440 million over 15 years. And for the next two weeks, he's the biggest story in baseball. And it's not close. So what do you think it'll take? Uh, we were just, uh, we opened the show by saying uh, anybody who's been, you know, planning for the future, as every general manager does in baseball, can take a look at their, what, top two, three prospects and say, vaya con Dios? Right? I mean, wouldn't that be it? Or what, what do you think it would take, at least, to get him? So, I, I, yeah, I, I look, the, the comp is, is Cabrera. Um, I think that was two, two really good players, and they took on the contract of Dontrell Willis uh, at the same time. Um, it's a hard one to say because I don't think, and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be, you know, avoiding the question here. Sure. Um, and I'm not even sure why it got to a place where two years removed from free agency, this, this is even a conversation. Uh, we're really going to expedite a deal for Juan Soto, and it appears, according to people that, that I know Buster only has spoken with, e- even I casually kind of get in the room's feel, said, no, he's going. Like, this is happening in the next two weeks. has to do as much with who's going to own the team um, as, as the present. Yeah, I think two or three – Major League ready players now. Um, Mike Rizzo is really good at his job. He doesn't lose trades, but this is a hard one to judge, and it will take three or four or five years to judge whether they did really well or or they got fleeced. Um, but yeah, two, three really major league ready players with a couple of prospects. And if you start to ask, well, who's who's in position to do that? The Padres, the St. Louis Cardinals. I think the Bonds experience in San Francisco brings them into the picture. I think, look, Julio Rodriguez and where the Mariners are now and where they're going is another possibility. And if I'm Steve Cohen or if I'm the richest owner in baseball, <laughs> I'm certainly going to my, my guy, Sandy Alderson, and saying, look, let's say money isn't a factor. Because <laughs> for me, it ain't. How, how much are we going to – how much is it going to cost us to get involved in this Juan Soto thing? And, and look, Sandy may say, we, we're not doing that. But DeGrom is coming up for a new contract. Maybe maybe you pivot and then you say to Soto and the Nationals, we we have these players, and they get a lot of players, and we got an owner, not that this part would be public, but uh, I got an owner who's willing to spend $500 million on this guy. So let's let's make it happen. The challenge is this is not in your world. This is not a sign-and-trade thing. You know, that's the the biggest challenge. It's not not like the Nationals can say, well, Steve, what are you willing to pay? Well, we'll give him seven for five hundred million dollars. Okay, well, we'll sign him to that, and then we'll make a deal. That, that's not going to happen. But if I'm Cohen, I'm certainly going to my my guys and saying, let's take money out of the equation, which no one ever says, but he has the ability to do it. And let's see what we can we can work on. Carl Ravitch here on the Rich Eisen Show. What if you're Brian Cashman, right? You got a team 
that is yep. uh, on fire. Um, mm-hmm. You know, obviously July they've they've slipped a bit, but still the lead is is uh, insurmountable in the division. You got the Astros sitting there right behind you, though, um, mm-hmm. and easily your best shot to win a World Series since '09. Do you? And I know this is nuts, but do you upset the apple cart for for Juan Soto? Do you really do that, or do you just go and target the needs that you have? Get that starting pitcher that I think they definitely need, um, and an extra bat. But is is Juan Soto the extra bat? I mean, you know what I mean? Like I I don't know. Do you do you really well, that's do why, that? That's why I think. Look, we grew up in the George Steinbrenner era. Of course, we grew up with this. This is a Yankee wheelhouse move. No doubt. When George Steinbrenner owns it, like all of a sudden, that's the team on top. If mm. Soto's free, the Yankees are going to be in on this. I personally don't think they do that. Now, like they got their own five hundred million dollar guy that they're trying to nail down. And yeah, but he's thirty, it. Carl. He's thirty. You know what I mean? Like, There's uh, no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. And look, we all know Yankee Stadium and a left-handed hitter. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things to like about that. Uh, but I would fall back on one guy doesn't 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 do it for me. What the Yankees do have, Rich, is they have all bu- they have a whole bunch of prospects. I mean, one thing Cashman's done in the last few years is load up on prospects, including a shortstop there, Volpe, who's terrific. Uh, and they got a lot of a lot of good players. Uh, uh, when it comes to baseball, having having watched this stuff, there's two things that, that kind of upset my apple cart. Every time we get around the draft um, and trade deadline, you hear organizations saying, we're not trading our prospects, which I never understood because you were the ones that mined the prospects. You found them. We just finished a draft. There's a lot of prospects. You, you can find more. I, I never quite got the team saying, well, we can't give up. Like, he's untouchable. Like, are you kidding me? It's baseball. There's seven more of those guys. We didn't know Juan Soto 10 years ago. We had barely known Julio Rodriguez two years ago. How are we doing now? One's, the, you know, the best player in the game, and one dominated a home run derby. So prospects don't scare me to move uh, with regards to a player like Soto. Um, and, and then the other one is the, is the financial component of it. You know, you, 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 you have money. All these teams, all these teams could afford a Juan Soto if they, if they made that decision. Uh, that the idea that we can't spend or we don't have the money to do that, you do. Um, and there are different, different market sizes, but that's a choice you can make. The Colorado Rockies just signed Chris Bryant to a massive deal after not giving Nolan Arenado money mm. uh, where did that money come right from? these teams have it so um but i don't i don't see the yankees as a realistic player but it's it's a two-year deal i mean you you can trade five prospects and you have them for two years and, and you run out of here you could certainly do that i don't see that carl ravich here on the rich eisen show um hey carl before i let you go tonight uh for tonight's uh game um it's uh would have been stewart's 57th birthday today and I've got his daughters, uh, Taylor and Sydney, in studio. Uh, in hour number two, we're going to have some ice cream and share some memories and talk awesome. talk awesome. about his uh, memorial fund. Um, that's an association so Stu, with by the Jimmy way, Big. Stu and I, Stu and I used to stand on the same soccer sidelines uh, when our kids were playing. Is soccer that together. right? Tell what was that like? What was that like? Was what was well, how is how is Stewart as a soccer dad? How was he? As a he soccer? was good. Like I mean, yeah. like like uh, he was not like Trey Wingo, who you know very well, yes. uh, was one of those guys when uh, Chappie was playing uh, football or or other sports. He would run up and down the sidelines. Stu was Stu was more reserved. Uh, he, he kind of he watched. He watched with great pride. Uh, he loved the athleticism of the girls, but he, he was less. He was less animated than others on the sideline. He, there, was, there, was, there was not a lot of booyah uh, for every kick or every group. Because at that age, you know, when there are six players on each side uh, and there's 12 around the, the soccer ball, there's not a lot of booyah going on. So it wasn't like the Sports Center commercial where he's, uh, no, no, no. he's, he's no. Uh, rejecting the, uh, the kids coming at the rack on him right or he's yelling at them or... right or yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, he didn't do that one there wasn't a lot of that there wasn't a lot of when he and kenny main were trying to motivate somebody said no you don't do it that way i need some energy out of you we didn't get a lot of that on the what's your memory of doing the shows with Stu, uh carl back in the day well 
I'll be honest with you. The memory of doing a, the shows with a lot of those guys was there was a there was a slight level of awe in in watching you know Olbermann and Patrick mm. and Stu because you're kind of you're kind of looking at individuals. You, you know this. Everybody is an individual, so everybody's doing their own thing. Right. Uh, there's great tag team stuff going on, but there's a lot of individual. He was a unique actor, and there's there's no doubt about that. He was such a wonderful actor. It's like almost watching a play from from literally two feet away. Like, oh my gosh, look at what this guy's doing. Look at how he does the highlights. He, I loved watching him. He bent over the desk. As he you did. know, he'd hold up the shot sheet. Yes. He'd have one eye on the shot sheet. He'd have one eye watching the video. Uh, and, and he was terrific. I so, was watching uh, him do that too. And and the things that I would watch him do, Carl, was he would when he would receive the shot sheet again. It's the, uh, for the for those who may not know, you get a you get paperwork, um, and and it's kind of like a line by line. They give you um, uh, basically to let you know what the situation is and what the the result is, and like, hey, it's two men on, and and then it's a three run homer and things like that is he would get the shot sheet in the commercial break, Carl, and then he would know where he could use his catchphrases and he would write them right. down on the shot sheet. And he right. would, and, and I just remembered, he would always spell out Booyah. He would spell out Booyah. It was B-O-O-Y-O-W. <laughs> That's how he would spell it, Booyah. That's how he would spell it on his shot sheets. And he would right. nail it. He would nail it every time, every single time. And you're right, he would bend over because, you know, he had, he had poor eyesight as well. Right. You know, and right. so, and he would always need the the lights up, but it was a party, man. Every time, every single time, whenever he did it, you know, so um, he would have been 57 today. Oh, and I had Killer in studio just a couple weeks ago. I had uh, Killborn here as well. <laughs> so that's the, yeah, I love that laugh. <laughs> Great laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. He would hey, feel good. Just remember, yeah. Bruins. Uh, Bruins Lightning. Yeah. You ever remember that uncle who used to kind of ask you to come behind the shed to try the skate? Let's go to the let's go to the highlights. Like, the, the, that was the lead into Bruins Lightning. That was the lead. Oh, you go, oh, God, yeah. So we all had that neighborhood and the family that had that rink. And remember when you walked down the street with your skate slung over your shoulder and the hockey stick, and then that guy would say, "Hey, come on over here and let me put your skates on." The Bruins and the Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be happy. There, to, you... there were two obsessions too. There was there was the, the randomness. Look, uh, he knows this. Steve Anderson. We're going. We're pulling the curtain back. But Go Steve for Anderson it. was in charge of Sports Center at that point. Um, after about two weeks, Ooh. I walked into Steve Anderson's office and I said, "I'm sorry, I, I don't get any of this. I can't do this. None of this is making sense." He, he's taught, he's got this Spud Webb obsession. Um, <laughs> There's a there's a Pooh Richardson Ooh. thing going on here. Uh, I'm used to working with people who seem to take this this thing, this sport thing, a little more seriously. And to his to his wonderful credit, Steve Anderson said, "Carl, I hear you. Be patient." And in about a month, uh, I was the straight man to his comedic act, and it was it really worked really really well. It so sure I, did, I man. Give Steve Anderson credit. Because that was a foreign language he was speaking. It's still just so you're aware. He still has a Minnesota Timberwolves fixation, in case you're wondering. Uh, and then yep. on occasion, uh, he would glance at the screen and uh, worry that the pants color that he was wearing was not being uh, accurately portrayed by the color on the screen. Uh, he was concerned about <laughs> that. Yeah, that. He's concerned Look, that the man, pants that was that coming across the two gold. In, he, he would sit in his cubicle and he would talk to himself, and the mirror was his best friend. He's a beautiful person. <laughs> oh, oh man! I mean, it's just <laughs> oh, poo! I, yeah, I, I'm sorry for digressing. This Not at all. This is great. A great time in our lives when uh, it was when uh, <laughs> Sports Center was was such a such an appointment viewing show, and and you and he and yeah. Stu and. Keith and Dan were all were all major faces and, and parts of that. Amazing, yeah. Stewart again would have been fifty seven today. I just figured I'd go to, uh, stroll down memory lane with you. Uh, great to listen to you. I really enjoy the you and the rest of the crew on Sunday nights. Um, and I look forward to the second half of the season. Let's do this again as we get closer to the playoffs. Carl, thanks for the time. Let's do it. Thanks, Rich. Great to be on with you, buddy. Right back at you. Enjoy tonight's All Star Game, Carl Ravage.